A bad day of fishing is still better than a good day at work. Now that's bumper sticker philosophy, kind of thing you'd expect to see on the back of a pickup truck. It's the kind of expression you've heard with other activities as well, like for example, a bad day of golfing beats any day at work. You know, as I sit out here, a little bit of fishing, enjoying the breeze and the water, I, I am thinking this is pretty good. In fact, I gotta wonder, is there such a thing as a bad day of fishing? Even if you don't catch a thing, you're still out here enjoying yourself. That's a good day. We're finishing up our sermon series this month on fishing. Fishing with Jesus in the Sea of Galilee, looking in the Gospels at stories that involve Jesus and fishing. This is gonna be the last story in the Gospels that involves fishing. It's found in John chapter 21. It's a story about Peter and Jesus and fishing on the Sea of Galilee. When the story begins, the setting is at the Sea of Galilee, probably a couple of weeks after the resurrection of Jesus. The disciples were told to go back home, and so they did. They're back in Capernaum, the fishing village beside the Sea of Galilee. And as they're there, they're waiting for Jesus. And as they do, one day of waiting and nothing happens, when evening comes around, Peter says, okay, here's what I've decided. John 21, verse three, Peter said, I'm going fishing. Now the other disciples who were with him, they, they said, okay, fine, we'll go with you. And now we have a fishing venture one evening on the Sea of Galilee. Now, Peter, of course, he's gonna be able to do this because he's got the experience. He is, after all, like all the disciples, former fishermen by trade. Which means Peter, Andrew, James, and John, all the rest of them who had done fishing there on those fishing villages, they've got access to boat and equipment. Speaking of uh, Peter and a fishing boat, you know, in 1986, they discovered at the Sea of Galilee an old, ancient fishing boat that they've dated back to the time of Jesus. That's why the museum has nicknamed it Jesus Boat, or some will call it St. Peter's Boat. The boat itself is typical of fishing boats of that era, about 17 feet long, about seven and a half feet wide. And so Peter is gonna grab one of those, maybe two of them, because there's gonna be seven of them that are gonna go fishing. Now, John tells us in verse two who the seven are that decided, let's go fishing. First, you have Peter himself. Then you have Thomas. You and I call him Doubting Thomas. Uh, that's not fair. Everybody doubted at the time, but he's the one that's famous for the doubting. But what John says is, this is Thomas, the one we call Didymus. Now, that word means twin. That was his nickname, the twin. It also says that Nathaniel went, and, and John mentions that Nathaniel was from Cana of Galilee. Now Cana, that's interesting to me because that's a, that's a little village up in the hills where Nazareth was, that they were neighboring towns and so he came from the same area Jesus came from originally. And that's where Jesus performed his first miracle, the changing of water to wine at the wedding feast of Cana. So you've got Thomas, you've got Nathaniel, John says, and then the sons of Zebedee. Well, that's John himself and his brother James, but you know, he has this thing in the Gospel of John, John never mentions his own personal name or his brother's name. He talks about everybody else, but for them it's just we're the sons of Zebedee for whatever reason. And then it says two other disciples he doesn't name for us. So you have these seven. And they decide to set out for an evening of fishing. Boy, that sounds pretty good. You know, fishing with friends, that's, that's what I see here because I wanna remind you that those earliest disciples of Jesus were family, neighbors, and friends. I've already told you this in our sermon series, that they were family because so many of them have family connections with each other. You've got the brothers, James and John, and, and the brothers, Peter and Andrew, plus fathers like Zebedee, the father of James and John, and, and mothers, like all those many women that were named as what Luke calls the women of Galilee who served the needs of Jesus. And so you've got family, but you have neighbors because they're all coming from right around this same area, the Sea of Galilee, those fishing villages like Capernaum, where Jesus set up shop, and, and next door at Bethsaida and the other fishing villages. They would have known each other even before the call to be disciples. They were family, they were friends, and I say friends because that's what they became. You, you couldn't help but become friends, because after all, if you're gonna spend time together, you get to like each other. And they spent time together, they worked together, 
day after day following Jesus in ministry. And sometimes he'd send them off two by two, two this way, two that way, and you spent time with someone and got to know them well. Then there's the meal times that they did together, and meal times always a great time to get to know people as you sit and eat and talk. They had conversation, they had fellowship, they became good friends. And even if they'd been friends before they became disciples, they now had become very good friends. In fact, at the Last Supper, John records in chapter 15 that as Jesus is assembled with his disciples, the apostles, he says, oh, I have longed to have this meeting with you, this dinner that we're having. And he says, I got to tell you, I used to call you my servants, but this evening I call you my friends. They had become good friends. And this is a great treat then for Peter and his friends to spend an evening of fishing. In fact, to me, that's one of the best things about fishing. Now, I grew up in Florida did a lot of fishing back in those days, and for me it wasn't about the fish or the fishing itself. It's because I went fishing with my father. My t two brothers and I fished a lot with our dad, and he loved all kinds of fishing. So we would get in the boat, we'd take our, our rod and reel, and we'd do that kind of fishing, but sometimes out on the pier and out on the jetties with a different pole as we would fish, we would go out into the Gulf of Mexico and do some fishing in his boat or get into one of the deep sea fishing boats and drop the line out deep. And sometimes it's just simply taking his flat bottom boat in the lagoon and gigging for the flounder. But I grew up doing a lot of fishing. Now I have to tell you, my father loved fishing. For me, it was just about being with my dad. I just enjoyed the time with him and the fishing was the way we did it. Whatever the motivation or reason, if you can spend time fishing with friends, now that's a good day. Now, this might not look like a particularly good fishing trip when you read the rest of the story. John 21 verse 3 says, So they went out that night to fish, and they caught nothing. That sounds like one of those bad day of fishing. But you know, when you read the rest of the story, it wasn't all that bad. I mean, they didn't catch anything themselves. But by the end of the night, as morning is coming, there's Jesus on the shore. They don't know who it is yet. They're going to find out. And he yells at them, drop your nets on the right side of the boat. And for whatever reason they did, maybe they thought the fellow on the shore could see something they couldn't see. Maybe they thought, why not? It's not going to hurt anything. But they did. They dropped their net on the right side. And that's where the miracle occurred, that Jesus gave them a miraculous catch of fish. John says 153. Somebody took the time to count them. I guess it was an impressive number of fish. So much so, it should have been enough to start tearing the nets. But it also says, but the nets didn't even tear. Sounds like another miracle at work. Not only that, when they finally got it into shore, there was Jesus waiting on them. And he had already had a fire lit and fish over the fire. Their breakfast was being cooked and ready to serve. And boy, what a day that was. As a night finished up of fishing, and then they spent that morning, the sun rising up on the horizon of the Sea of Galilee. They had the fire. They had breakfast with Jesus. I'll tell you, that turned out to be a pretty good day of fishing after all. Well, that's what he did. Peter went out fishing with friends. But I got to ask this question, a question for you to consider. Why did Peter go fishing? Now, you might be thinking, hey, fishing doesn't need a reason. It's, you just do it. But I got to ask that question because Peter had given up fishing. I mean, that had been his career. That was his vocation. He and everybody else, they were fishermen by trade. But he left his nets. And he went to follow Jesus, devote himself to be a disciple of Jesus, to become an apostle, trained to be a preacher of the gospel. And that's how he now spent his time. But now he's going back to fishing. Why fishing? You know, some have wondered, was he getting discouraged? Was he giving up and quitting? You could understand why that might be the case. After all, what he'd just done just a few weeks earlier, he had denied Jesus three times. Said he wouldn't do it, but he did denied Jesus three times, and then Jesus on that third time turned and looked at him straight in the eye. You know he had to be ashamed and embarrassed, probably hurting and wounded deep within his soul. And some have wondered if on this evening, Peter in his being down and low about how he had been unfaithful to Christ, what if he's decided, you know what, I'm just going to slip away into the night, quietly go back to what I was doing, and hope everybody forgets, hope that I can one day forget what I did. Well, I suppose that's a possibility, but that's not what I think. I don't think that's what's happening with Peter at all. No, when Peter said, I'm going fishing, he was trying to fill in the time 
while he was waiting for Jesus. See, he and the disciples were told to wait on Jesus. Back in the upper room when they had that last supper, Jesus was very cryptic, and yet some things he said were crystal clear, at least to us, not so much to them. But one thing he told them was, he is going to die. They didn't accept that. He would rise again on the third day. They didn't understand that. He said, and when that's done, I want you to head back home from Jerusalem. Go back to Dr Galilee. I'll meet you there. Now that part was reinforced later. On Easter Sunday, when the women were outside the tomb and they found it empty and the angels appeared, the angels said, now you go tell his disciples that he is risen and you tell them that he said, go to Galilee and he'll meet you there. Well, that finally did click with them. So they left Jerusalem and they went back north to their home in Galilee, back to Capernaum and Bethsaida, back to those fishing villages, and they waited for Jesus. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited, day after day. On this particular day, after a day of waiting, Peter decides, I'm I, I, this sitting around and doing nothing, that, that's for the birds. I'm gonna go fishing. You see, the reason he went fishing was to fill in the time while he was waiting for Jesus. And what he did was a good thing. It was constructive and productive. I mean, after all, catching fish, you can eat it, as well as sell it, and that's good for their uh, business. You see, he did something constructive and productive, but also familiar and refreshing. And that may be exactly what the doctor ordered for Peter about this time in his life, something that would help his soul find some peace of mind. And so, yes, he and the disciples, they went fishing while they were waiting for Jesus. Now, I look at that, I'm thinking there's a parallel between Peter's situation and our situation today, because we find ourselves also waiting for Jesus. Yes, we've been waiting for a long time, 2,000 years and still counting, but long ago, Jesus said, I I'm gonna go home for a while, but I will come back. Remember John chapter 14, verses one through three? I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, and then when I do, I'll come back and gather you up and take you to be with me forever. And so, yes, we've been waiting for that day, still waiting. Paul describes that wait. He says, for example, in Philippians chapter 3, he says, we are eagerly awaiting our Savior to return from heaven. I like the way Peter does it in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, we are longing for and hastening the day. It's not only are we eager for it to happen, but it's almost like we're crying out, well, come on, come on already. In fact, that's what John does. At the end of the book of Revelation, that final chapter, the closing verses, he says, Maranatha, which means, come, Lord Jesus, come on. We're ready for you now. Well, that was the attitude even then, and that wasn't just a few years after he left. Well, we've been 2,000 years and hopefully your heart is still longing for the return of Christ, and that you're saying, Maranatha, come on, Lord, I'm ready for you now. Yes, we are waiting for that day. So what are we to do while we're waiting for Jesus? Well, it's a lot like what Peter did, as he filled in his time with something good, something constructive, something refreshing, something fun. And that's what we still do to this day. While we wait, we don't just sit around and do nothing. No, when we're young, we go to school and we get some education. And then we get a job and we try to make a living. A and we get married and we raise a family and we pursue our vocation, our dreams, and we sometimes have a little bit of fun and have a vacation, maybe even go fishing. You see, that's what you do while you're waiting for the Lord to return. But also like Peter, I gotta say this, not just all of those kind of things, but also while you're waiting, you want to give him some time of service. One of the lessons I want you to get from Simon Peter is that Simon Peter was a faithful servant of the Lord, and he was faithful to the very end. Now, when I say that about Peter, I know that faithfulness means something to him because Jesus taught it time and time again in his sermons, especially in the parables of Jesus. Jesus told several parables that have to do with readiness, being ready for the day when the Lord returns. He always set up the parables with a story of some master of the household, and then there would be the, the servants who, who serve his will, and so he gives them jobs. He says, I'm leaving, and I, I will come back. I don't know yet to tell you when, but you just be doing what I tell you to do, and you be at your post serving and ready for me on the day I return. He told it different ways. 
it'd be a household servant supposed to do a job at the house. It might be the, the ten virgins supposed to have their candles ready to go. But whatever he said, you do your jazz task while I'm gone and then be ready for that day I return doing what I asked you to do. So he told those parables of readiness. Stay ready. Peter heard those parables and Peter's life lived it out. Now we're catching just one moment in his life, just one evening where he's out fishing with his friends. That's a good thing. It was blessed by Jesus with the miraculous catch and with the breakfast. But I tell you, that was just one evening. Expand that to the rest of his life. You'll see a man who was a faithful servant of Jesus all the way. He was faithful in service in the Galilean ministry before the resurrection. And then after the resurrection, he stayed faithful to his death. For many years, Peter was a great preacher. He preached the day of Pentecost, the first gospel sermon. 3,000 people responded with repentance and baptism on that day. He preached the first gospel sermon to a Gentile, to Cornelius, and took that man and baptized him into Christ. And he was a missionary who went to Asia Minor and worked there with those churches, Ephesus and the other churches. And church tradition says he even made it as far as Rome. And Peter one day died, not just a peaceful death, but he died as a Christian martyr, crucified on a cross like his Lord and Savior, crucified because he was faithful to Jesus to the very end. If you ask Peter, what are you supposed to do while you wait for Jesus? You do exactly the same kind of thing he did. So I got to ask you that question. What are you doing for Jesus while you wait? I mean, you and I, we're waiting for Jesus to come back one day for us. Whether it be the second coming or whether it be the day we die, we're waiting for Jesus to come back. So what are you doing while you wait for Jesus? Now, I know you're doing a lot of other things, because we do. we we got to take care of our jobs and our family and, and have a little bit of fun and, and do some fishing. But what are you doing for the Lord while you wait for Him to return? I got to remind you of what I always say. I, I work it in every sermon I can of just those basics we want to always remember. For example, I always remind you that every day you want to spend a little bit of time in prayer to the Lord. So you're talking to Him and then read a chapter a day from the Scriptures so you can hear Him talk to you. That conversation should be a daily thing. Are you, are you doing that while you wait for the Lord to return? I always encourage you to gather with your other friends in Christ, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, and gather as the church on the Lord's Day when we gather to, to celebrate our Lord, to spend time in the Word and, and in prayer and, and spend time in that holy fellowship. Are you doing that on a regular basis? And of course, are you involved in some kind of Christian service and ministry? Where actually just roll up your sleeves and put your hands on and do something and you're doing for others in the name of the Lord and not just always receiving as others do their service and ministry towards you. You know, those are the basics, but they're basics for a reason. They're the fundamentals I think our Lord expects from us. I gotta ask you, are you taking the time to do those very things and do them consistently and regularly? If not, it's time to get back on track and be faithful to the Lord while we wait for our Lord to return. You know, there's an old classic hymn many of us grew up in the church singing. It's a great one. It, it just simply says, we'll work till Jesus comes and we be gathered home. Now, we always hear the last part of it. We're going to be gathered home in heaven. That's the great part, but I like to hear the first part. We'll work. We'll do. We'll do the good that the Lord has set for us to do. We'll be faithful servants to the very end. That's the way you wait for your Lord to return. So. What are you doing for Jesus while you wait for his return? Well, Peter gives us some good examples of what we can do. Oh, Peter reminds us that there are some things on this earth that we can do and enjoy. Work our jobs, love our families, have some fun, maybe even go do some fishing. But keep in mind that Peter wasn't just a man who could fish for fun and business. He was a man who understood we have a calling to be fishers of men. We have a great commission the Lord has given us, and that needs to be a part of what we do while we wait for Jesus. Carve out some time. Give Him some of your energy in service and ministry, in doing good for others in the name of Jesus. And that's the way to spend your time while you're waiting for Jesus. God bless you.